Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. It is a privilege for us to be here this morning. I am very thrilled that your pastor asked me and my family to come up here and fill the pulpit for him. He has been to our church. Uh, it was years ago. We've asked him to come back, and it hasn't worked out yet. <laughs> We're hoping to have your pastor back up there. Pastor Blaylock wants to have him back up there. And I know your pastor wants to get Pastor Blaylock down here, so that would be great, too. Uh, you met my family, my wife Deanna and my son Aaron back there. Of course, we got two kids that are back in the nursery, Carrot and Jordan, and a uh, privilege to have the family that God gave me. I am the administrative pastor at Beacon Baptist Church, and um, I've been in the ministry for about 15 years now. Started out as a youth pastor in North Georgia, and then after that, my wife and I hit the deputation trail, and we started raising support so that we could go overseas and help plant a church. And, so we 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 lived in first we went to um, Venezuela. We were actually trying to go there, and then of course I'm sure everybody knows what the situation that's going on there. But that was about the time that the president, the then president, came in and and um, he blocked everything. He basically blocked all missionary visas, and we couldn't get a visa there. So after that, we went down to Peru and and um, we helped in a church down there. And then where we spent most of our time was in Spain, and we were over there. We helped start a church over there. And um, with my wife's parents, who have been missionaries for 35 plus years now, and they're still over there. They're actually back here on furlough right now, so that church is still over there, going strong. They actually need a new building because it's just getting too big. They're in a little storefront, and um, uh, they're just outgrowing everything. We took a missions trip with our church over there last year, and um, and basically our whole group that was over there had to stand almost the whole time because there were just the, the building was packed out. So the church is up and running. Um, so God's given us an exciting journey. I'm thankful for how the Lord has um, worked in our lives, and, and we've had an exciting journey. We've lived on three different continents. I've been able to work in various churches and cultures and uh, been able to help start and establish churches. And I always say it is a privilege to serve the Lord. It is a privilege. And serving the Lord is kind of the topic that I want to talk about this morning and hit on tonight also. So open your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Philippians. We're going to be looking at the book of Philippians, very familiar text, chapter 1. We're going to look at verses 18 through 21. As you're turning there, you know it's a rather interesting story of how my wife and I got married. We were both at Bible college. And um, in November, this particular Bible college would have their missions conference. And after their missions conference, they would go into the gym, and you would kind of fellowship, and they'd have food. And they, they went all out. They built these um, displays, you know, like so if, they, if one of their missionaries was to Africa, they'd build a hut, you know, so they went all out. But anyhow, we were in the gym, and, and um, Deanna and I didn't know each other. We just, we had mutual friends, okay, so... Uh, we were all in a group talking with our mutual friends, and somewhere along the way, Deanna and I started talking. And um, I think it was, I personally think they set us up. They, they knew we were both single, so I guess they figured we would make a good couple. So we started talking, and before we knew it, we looked around, and all of our friends had disappeared. And so we were there alone just talking with one another. And, of course, over time, you know, we, we kept talking, and we started sitting with one another at meals, and we started talking on the phone, and uh, we started to get to know each other. We started to, to like each other, and before you know it, um, we just couldn't be apart from one another. So, as you know, in college, you have a Christmas break, and usually the, the Christmas break is four to five weeks. And so the Christmas break rolled around, and, you know, we... At this college, you always have a, a service that you go to in the morning. It's the last service before you go home for the Christmas break. And, you know, I just, I liked her so much, I didn't want to be apart from her. So I decided that I was going to do something special for her. So that she would remember me while we were apart for those four or five weeks. So I thought to myself, you know, my wife, she grew up, she, her parents are missionaries, and they, she was on the mission field all her life. She went over to Spain when she was three years old. So she was fluent in Spanish and English, so she knew Spanish. I didn't know a word of Spanish. And so I thought to myself, you know what would be cool is before we leave, I'll say I'll miss you in Spanish. And so I asked a good friend of mine, quote unquote good friend, who quote unquote knew the language, what this phrase was. And so he told me what the phrase was, and so I practiced it. 
all day. I practiced it in the shower. I practiced it in the <laughs> dorm. You know, I was just practicing. And, you know, my, my friends, I, I'd see them over in the corner, they'd be laughing at me. I was like, I know, I probably have a bad accent or something like that. So, but I practiced it. And so the day came where we were going to leave, and I mustered up the courage to go up to her and say this phrase. And I looked her straight in the eye, and I said it. And she kind of looked at me funny. I thought, all right, I didn't say it right, bad accent or whatever, so I said it again. And she said, Jeff, what are you trying to say? And I said, well, I'm trying to say I'll miss you. And she said, well, Jeff, you just asked me to marry you. <laughs> <laughs> so here we are, happily married today. Uh, God works in mysterious ways, doesn't he? Uh, that's awesome. <laughs> Philippians chapter 1, verse 18, we'll go ahead and read. The Bible says... What then, notwithstanding every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And I therein do rejoice, yea, and will rejoice. For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. Verse 21 says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Our text today is in the book of Philippians. And I think it is safe to say that the book of Philippians is a favorite amongst Christians. I would gather that even this morning, many of you, if we asked, there would be many of you that would say, you know what, the book of Philippians is one of my favorite books in all of the New Testament possibly even the whole Bible. This book reminds us that there is hope and there's strength and there's joy even in the midst of trials and unfortunate circumstances. I personally have heard many preachers say from the pulpit that when preaching from the book of Philippians that the very principles and the very truths of this book found in this epistle have made a significant impact upon their lives. It is also a book that reminds us of a very significant event in the plan of God throughout the ages. The Apostle Paul is writing the letter to the church at Philippi, a group of believers that started from an obvious change in direction, orchestrated by the Holy Spirit of God, that would eventually impact many nations, including our own nation, throughout history. We find this account in Acts chapter 16. You know it well, you don't have to turn there. Paul with Silas, he's on his second missionary journey, and his intention after passing through the Galatian region was to move further west in the province of Asia. However, the Bible says that they were forbidden of the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia and that they essayed to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit suffered them not. <clears throat> then while in Troas, of course, this is where Paul heard the old famous Macedonian call, knowing that the Lord was calling them to preach the gospel in this place. Paul would eventually end up in Philippi where, because of his obedience and following the Holy Spirit, an encounter with a young woman named Lydia, remember that? And another encounter with a Philippian jailer would eventually would change their lives and their position before a holy God forever. And there in an unlikely place began a church. And this is a church that throughout Paul's life would encourage him through tough times would send him financial support, and even when they had limited funds, they were a support to the Apostle Paul throughout his ministry. In this rare epistle, Paul is not refuting doctrinal error like he did with the Galatians. He's not rebu rebuking gross carnality like he did with the Corinthians. So it is somewhat rare that he doesn't start this particular epistle with the need to state his apostleship like he does in so many of his other epistles. Instead, Paul begins in verse 1, and he begins stating who he serves. Look at it with me, would you? Verse 1, the Bible says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ. Paul calls himself a servant. A servant is someone who serves others. Someone who cares for the affairs of another. Someone who is devoted to helping another person. You know, many times when we think of servant or servitude. Our minds drift to kings and kingdoms and lowly servants who do the king's bidding, right? They work tirelessly for a meager wage with little recognition. 
The connotation of a servant oftentimes gives the idea of someone who is of a lower class, maybe not educated with little ambition, especially in our society today. The idea is that our heroes have to be, and our leaders have to be athletes and actors and politicians, and that we need to strive to be more like them. The idea of a servant is not always a highly respected notion. However, Paul says that he is a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no greater position, there is no greater purpose than being a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that is exactly what we are as his children. If you're saved here today, if you are a believer, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have been bought with a price, and we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. As the Apostle Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, sits in prison. If you know the book of Philippians, that's where he is, awaiting his fate. He pins these mighty words that we find in our text in chapter 1 and verse 20. Look at it with me. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. In this very text, we can see Paul's philosophy on life. We can see the type of attitude that he carried throughout his journey. We can see the very heart of this humble servant of God. As always, we can learn some great lessons some significant lessons. And this morning, I want to speak on this subject, the heart of a servant. Because I truly believe that if you are a child of God in this room today, if you're saved, we should all have the desire to have the heart of a servant. Let's pray. Father, we love you and we thank you so much for your goodness. We're grateful for this time that we can spend around your word, that we can spend teaching and preaching your word and learning from your word. And Father, we're just grateful for the group of believers that are here this morning that make up the Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And Father, may you, may you speak to all of our hearts. May you speak to my heart as we listen to your word this morning. May you help us as we talk about being a true servant. May you help us leave better than how we came before. We love you, Lord. May we glorify you in everything that we do. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Amen. There are three simple lessons that we see here about the heart of a servant. The first one we see is that at the heart of the servant, there is a willingness to serve the master. In verse 1 of Philippians chapter 1, the word used for servants, it's the Greek word literally meaning bond servant or slave. The word describes a person who is owned by someone else. They become subservient to and dependent on that person. So in other words, Paul is saying that he and Timothy... They're bond servants. They're slaves to the Lord Jesus Christ. Their lives are owned by Him. They are subservient to Him, and they are dependent upon Him. The word used in, is used several times in the New Testament in reference to a believer's relationship with Christ. And it describes a willing, determined, and devoted service to the Master. It reflects the attitude of an Old Testament slave who refused the opportunity for freedom and voluntary, voluntarily resubmitted himself to the master for life. You remember, don't you, under the Mosaic Law in Exodus 21, where a slave or a bond servant could plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children. I will not go free. The slave could choose to stay with his master instead of gaining his freedom. And what a powerful truth for us today. We have been bought with a price. We are servants of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And instead of choosing the things of this world and gaining, as the world would say, our freedom, we can choose to serve our Master with devotion, determination, and willingness. A true servant is always more than willing to serve the Master. You may be thinking, Brother Jeff, this seems to be a little bit of a paradox, maybe an oxymoron. A servant who isn't willing to serve? That doesn't seem to make sense, does it? A servant has only one purpose, and that is to serve. And you know what? <coughs> you would be right. That is the purpose of a servant, to serve. Most servants in ancient days were overly careful about making sure that they were doing their jobs. This was their livelihood, which meant if they weren't serving, that it would cost them their jobs, 
and sometimes in extreme cases, it could cost them their lives. And so, beloved, the paradox or oxymoron that we see today is a servant of the Most High God who doesn't serve or isn't willing to serve the Master. After Deanne and I got married, as I said before, we were hired on staff at a church in North Georgia. And so one day I was with another member. We were making some visits. We knocked on a man's door, and he welcomed, welcomed us in. We had a wonderful conversation about the gospel, about our Lord, about how Jesus gave his life so that we could live. Toward the end of the conversation, we started some small talk about the church and about some of the upcoming functions in the church. And so I mentioned that we were needing to have a work day at the church and that we wanted to have a day that, where the church did something for the community so that the community around us could get to know our church better and, of course, really at the height of it so that they could hear the gospel. Right then, the other member of the church that was with me, he chimed in and he said, yeah, you know, we'd love to do something like that, but we may not get enough help to be able to pull it off. To which this man, whom we had never met, that we're talking to, he had never been to church, nor was he a Christian, responded in this way. It would seem odd that a church couldn't get enough people to help with something. Aren't church people supposed to serve their God? Even though this man didn't understand the gospel or the principles of Scripture, and really didn't even understand how to express what he was saying, he understood that it was weird, a weird thing, maybe even an oddity, when a servant wasn't willing to serve the master. At the heart of a servant, there is a willingness to serve the master. Paul's willingness to serve and give his life for the Lord Jesus Christ is evident all throughout Scripture, and especially in our text this morning. Look at what he says in verse 19. For I know that this sh shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. We can plainly see the heart of a servant that at the heart of a servant, it doesn't matter what is happening in life. It doesn't matter what our circumstances around us are. Regardless of the opposition and the persecution, whether he lives or dies, Christ, his master, will be magnified and glorified. This servant's focus is glorification or magnification of the master. Which brings us to our second lesson that we see from the heart of a servant, that not only is there a willingness to serve, but also at the heart of the servant, there is joy despite the circumstances. Look at verse 19 in our text. Paul says, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness as always. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by by death. I want to remind you of the dire circumstances surrounding the Apostle Paul as he writes this letter. As we noted before, Paul is in prison. He's literally chained to a Roman guard, pondering the fate that awaits him. And he says in verse 19, For I know that this shall turn to my salvation through your prayer. Salvation here is another word for deliverance. And the Apostle Paul is saying that whatever may happen to me, even in the midst of these circumstances, even in the horrible situation that I find myself in, I know and am confident that I will be delivered. Look at what he says in the latter part of verse 20. So now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. You see, he understood that he would be delivered from his current situation, from his current circumstance, by either being set free to go on with his life, or perhaps being set free in death and going on to live with his Savior. And verse 21 says, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. You see, the heart and attitude of this humble servant was a heart of joy, full, knowing full well that his Savior would be magnified with his life and his death. If he was to stay alive, his life would be spent for Christ. However, even if he died, 
there would be gain because he would be in the presence of the one who died for him. I wonder if that is tr the true statement in our lives. I wonder if that is a true statement in modern Christendom today. Or maybe it would say something like this. For to me to live is money and to die is great loss. For to me to live is sports and to die is just unimaginable. For to me to live is for myself and to die is a tragedy. But Paul says, for to, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It is even better than living. You see, at the very heart of this servant, his happiness and joy was not based upon his situation or his circumstance in life. You know, it would seem that, the peop that people today are consumed by the passionate pursuit of happiness. There are so many self-help books, motivational speakers, advice columnists who claim to offer the key to happiness, but so many people still can't find the key to unlock this elusive idea of a state of a complete lifetime of happiness. Isn't that what our society promotes? The big companies who want, to, want us to buy their products, they promise us that if we partake of their product or idea that we will be happy, right? You know, Disney World, my family loves Disney World. Mickey Mouse, I mean, my son, he likes to watch Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck. But they make the claim to be the happiest place on earth, right? With Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and Winnie the Pooh, I mean, who doesn't smile when they see Pooh Bear? So it claims to be the happiest place on earth until a family from Europe takes their life savings and they spend it on airfare and a 10-day vacation at a resort, at a Disney resort in the parks, and they arrive in the dead heat of summer. We all know how that is, right? <laughs> the dead heat of summer, they're shoulder to shoulder with 90 to 100,000 other people. And little Sally says, Daddy, I want to go on the poo ride, which is a 120 minute wait. <laughs> to which Daddy says, Daddy says, no way, no way. And little Sally starts kicking and screaming and crying because Daddy won't wait 120 minutes in extreme heat to get on a 45 second ride just to see Pooh Bear. <laughs> yes, it's the happiest place on earth, right? Amen. You know, we lived in the suburbs of Atlanta for a while when we were in that church in North Georgia. And one of our favorite places to go was the World of Coke Museum. And, you know, I absolutely love Coke. And it's honestly to the degree that if I know beforehand that we're going to go to a restaurant that serves Pepsi, it will literally alter the decision of whether we go to that restaurant or not. You can ask my family, it's very true. So the world of Coke is really cool. We've, we've been back several times. Anytime we pass through Coke, or every time we pass through Atlanta, we, we try to go there. But you get to see all the trinkets and all the bottles, all the paraphernalia, and all the Coke stuff and, um, that they've put out through the years. And you can go into a room, you can watch the old Coke commercials. They have commercials you know, from all the years prior commercials that they do all around the world. It's really cool. But the best thing, of course, is when you, you get to the end and you go into the tasting room and you get to taste all the Coke that's all around the world. Um, and you can taste Coke and all the different flavors that they have and you can literally stand there for hours and just drink as much as you want. It's great. It's like a little taste of heaven. So when you first enter the museum, they take you into this room. It's full of pictures and collectibles that we all know and love. And the worker escorts the group. They take you in as a group, and they escort you. They ask some trivia questions about Coke. And when, when, when they're done, what they do is they escort you into this little room, like a theater-type room. Um, you sit down, and you watch this short animated film. And one of the first things that pops up on the screen is a question, what is true happiness? And the basic message of Coke, or this animated film, and really Coke itself, is that happiness is anything that brings a smile to someone's face. So since millions of people drink and enjoy Coke, and it brings a smile to their faces, then buy our product, and at least for that moment, you will be happy. That's their message. <laughs> and you know what? This is really the idea and the message of our modern day society and what it teaches about happiness. Happiness is all about how we feel. It's about our circumstances in life. Being in the right place at the right time. Doing whatever it takes to put ourselves in the perfect situation so that we are happy. 
So then being at the happiest place on earth or drinking a product that brings a smile to our face or doing whatever it is that brings our range of emotions to this point of bliss, this is what can bring us this happiness, this fulfillment or contentment. And with this continual pursuit of happiness, this idea, it unfortunately spills over into the core areas of life. It becomes a quest for that perfect circumstance or that perfect possession in life that will make someone happy. If I just have the right job or the right relationship or maybe the right house or if I have a better car or the right gadget, then I will be happy. It is interesting because if we look at these statements that Paul is making here in our text, in really what he says throughout his epistle, we begin to understand that this idea of being in the right place or the right circumstance or situation brings happiness or joy in our lives is far from what Paul is trying to teach us about true biblical joy and contentment. As Paul is chained up in this prison, he is writing statements of faith and encouragement and joy such as these that we find in our text. For example, Christ shall be magnified in my body whether it be by life or by death, or for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And then in chapter 4 and verse 4, he says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again I say rejoice. And then in verse 11, Now that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. You see, beloved, Paul knew that from a life of winding roads and twists and turns, unforeseen and undesirable circumstances, that a life of joy and a life fulfilled is wrapped up in a single statement. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. At the heart of this servant there was true joy and true contentment despite the circumstances. Paul's joyful countenance and encouraging demeanor as we see through his writing here doesn't come from those outside possessions that he had in life or the perfect picture situations surrounding him. It came from knowing his Savior and the desire to magnify and glorify his Savior's name. And that leads us to our third and final lesson quickly. That At the heart of a servant, there is not only a willingness to serve the Master, joy despite the circumstances, but there is also a desire to, to glorify the Lord with our life. Once again, look at verse 20 with me, if you would. According to my earnest expectation and my hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but that with all boldness as always, so now also Christ shall be magnified in my body, whether it be by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Paul says that his great passion in life is that in his life, Christ would be glorified, supremely glorified. This is why God created us and saved us, isn't it? To make Christ look like what he really is, supremely glorious. So the connection between verse 20 and 21 is very important to understand what Paul is trying to relate here. Paul says Christ is going to be magnified in my body by life or by death. Because now watch this, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul is explaining that in both cases, whether it be life or death, Christ is going to be magnified and glorified. He will be glorified by my life because for to me to live is Christ. So Paul goes on to explain in chapter 3 and verse 8 where he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. So Christ is more precious, He's more valuable, more satisfying than all that life on this earth can give. I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. So here's what Paul is essentially saying as a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, for me to live is Christ. In other words, Paul is saying my credentials, 
By the way, we know Paul had some hefty credentials, don't we? In fact, he lists them before the verse that we just read in chapter 3 and verse 4. If any man thinketh that he hath, hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, in Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. So again, Paul is saying that my credentials, my worldly possessions, my ambitions, my riches don't and cannot satisfy me. Only Christ and His presence in my life can satisfy me. For me, for to me to live is Christ. When I am satisfied and content in Christ, then He truly glorified, He is truly glorified by my life. And then Paul adds one of the most unorthodox statements when he says, and to die is gain. Whenever you hear somebody talk about death, it's always associated with pain and loss and tragedy, right? However, Paul again relates to verse 20, Christ will be magnified by my life and also by my death. Look at it from this perspective. If you were to add up all of the things that you would lose at death, family, job, <coughs> possessions, maybe your dream retirement, the friends that you would leave behind, your favorite pleasures in life, if you added up all those losses and you stacked those losses against Christ, I think that all of us would come to the same conclusion as the Apostle Paul, that even in death it is gain because we will be with our Savior. This attitude, this type of heart glorifies Christ. One preacher put it this way, if you glorify Christ in your dying, there is no big performance or achievement or heroic sacrifice. There is simply a childlike laying yourself in the arms of the one who makes the loss of everything gain. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. It can be summed up in this way. Christ is glorified in our lives when He is more precious to us than all that life can offer and more precious than all that death can take away. In the very first verse of the epistle, Paul states boldly that he's a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is evident throughout this epistle and all of the New Testament that Paul gave his life to serve his God. He has a true heart of a servant. May all of us be able to say with boldness, as Paul has said, that we are true servants to the Lord Jesus Christ. And may our actions confirm what our words have said. Our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed just for a moment. Nobody's looking. You know, it's evident in Paul's life that his main focus, his heart's desire, was to fulfill his calling to be a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe you're here today, you're here this morning, and you are a Christian and you say, Brother Jeff, I too desire to please the Lord with all of my heart. And like Paul, I want to have a heart of a servant. Is that you today? Would you just end up indicate that by raising your hand just real quickly? Thank you. I'm wonderful. I raise my hand too. Maybe you're here this morning and you can't relate to this message. Maybe you're not a child of God. You don't know what being a servant of God is because you have not been bought by Him. You have not placed your faith in Him. You have never put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. I just want to simply ask, is there anyone like that here today? I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. I just want to pray for you. Anybody like that here today? Just lift up your hand. Maybe you've never placed your Lord, your, your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. Anybody like that? Alright. So I'm going to ask our brother to come and we'll just close out with a hymn of invitation or however he sees fit. Alright. Let's go ahead and stand and take our hymn books. We'll turn to hymn number 249. We'll sing just the first verse. <clears throat> 